So Richard Bell is the writer and director of the movie Brotherhood. It shook me deeply. My live conversation with him is here. And we're going to start up the fake book. Are you on fake book? Fake book. Yeah, I'm on fake book. Yeah, fake book. I'll take, I'll take the cheap views right now. And I hope that somebody that's watching um, is driven over to watch this movie. Richard Bell is the writer and director of the movie called Brotherhood. If you're searching it on the net, search Brotherhood Movie 2009, because I think there's another movie called Brotherhood, maybe? 2019. 19, exactly, sorry. <laughs> search Star Trek 2009 okay. and search Brotherhood 2019. I'm, I'm, I'm dated by at least a decade, always, always, always. That's okay. Uh, so, Richard, really, thank you for your time, and thank you uh, to your PR group, Ingrid, uh, for uh, hooking this up. Maybe just start out a little bit about telling us a little bit about who you are, maybe not what you do, but like, who are you as a human being, Richard? Uh, who am I as a human being? It's always the toughest that, question. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that I'm a storyteller first. Okay. I, I am a truth seeker. I would say I'm a treasure hunter. Um, and and, and I, I am very attracted to true stories, uh, especially stories from the past. Um, they have always fascinated me. I, I'm a bit of a history buff, not in an academic way, uh, but uh, I, I do love finding stories from the past. Uh, I think that in Canada we have so many stories that are so amazing and that have such a great cool factor to them, but we don't celebrate them like the Brits do or like the Americans do. Um, especially the Americans. The Americans love stories from their past. We we don't even know that they half of them exist, or we feel shy or embarrassed, or we don't think that they're worth celebrating. Um, so in that sense, like when I say treasure hunter, that's how you know I tied into introducing you to Brotherhood, which is that you know I I found a tiny little story about this true story about the Brotherhood of Saint Andrew. Um, in a newspaper when I was living in Toronto in 2006. And uh, it was just a tiny story about an 80th anniversary mass that was being put on for the Brotherhood of St. Andrew and their ordeal on Balsam Lake. And there wasn't very much there, but um, it just captured my imagination. And then I went hunting for treasure. That's when I started. Like at the time, there was not really anything about them and their ordeal um, on the lake, uh, on the internet. So I researched it through my public library here in Vancouver. And then, of course, all the microfiche, microfiche are, are all scanned now. So it's a lot easier um, to, to do research. But, yeah, I'm a treasure hunter and a storyteller. I just I like looking for things and finding things and, and laying my imagination around real events. Awesome. Now, um, tell us about a little bit about the premiere. I saw you went back to Balsam Lake and yeah. really – just took over the community with this release yeah. and you know this has got to be dude i was so moved by this film and and like we said offline just before we started here uh, i'm a tough nut when it comes to movies i find myself saying well doesn't anybody make any good movies anymore i haven't been really moved by a movie since i don't know jacob's ladder you know yeah. way <laughs> angel heart like they're they're, they're decades old yeah. And uh, wow, the acting was just great. I I knew nothing about the history and the story. And so I, I looked it up a little bit, not enough to spoil the story for the movie mm -hmm. when I watched it. And I watched it yesterday. Just incredibly moved. The acting, the cinematography. Wow. Uh, yeah. and, and you expect, and I've learned this, uh, I, I've got a friend in town here who's a, a movie producer. And I expected that when he did a movie, that it was going to look like the beachcombers. It was going to be bad. <laughs> it was going to be bad acting. It was going to hey. be horrible scenery. Uh, it looked like it was shot on, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, an Insta cam. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this dude, um, Jason Lupish is his name. Uh, he, he did a movie called Fight, and he did uh, uh, oh, what a beautiful, uh, what a beautiful thing. Anyway. When I saw it, now he's a homer. He's my hometown guy, but man, he made this thing look like Hollywood. And it, it doesn't it doesn't mean that if you're a Canadian or even if I'm not saying you're low budget, but even this these small filmmakers have a way of telling a story and making it look Hollywood, for lack of a better term. So I was really moved. Uh, watched it 
one and a half times fought, caught the first half and went back to the f picked up from the first third and went and watched it again last night and and I have I had trouble getting to sleep last night bro it was really it was really messing with my mind a little bit so and not like from a horror standpoint yeah. and this is what really got me I thought it was beautiful now I don't want to give the story away you can you can tell as much of the story as you want as far as yeah, I know it's historical it's you know you can look it up but I was I thought what a beautiful beautiful film and it's not, hey it's not a feel good film in any no, it uh, is but it is it leaves you well, with it is, but it isn't yeah it leaves you hopeful in this strange way out of a a complete tragedy somehow my mind was racing and laying in bed last night, and I had an early morning today, and I'm like, go to sleep, go to sleep. My mind just wouldn't shut off. So that's a testament to your talent, brother. I really appreciated it. Thank you. Wow. That's – I don't – wow. Thank you. That's, you know, that's what every filmmaker, I'm sure, wants, wants to hear. Uh, uh, let me back up a bit and explain why it looks so good. I had uh, an exceptional, extraordinary director of photography – and um, his name is Adam Suica. And he, uh, speaking actually of horror, he's, he, he did a lot of films with George A. Romero. Um, and uh, he, uh, he shot The Haunting in Connecticut. Uh, but he's like, a, Adam Suica is kind of like a cross between a poet, like, like a poet like Byron, and a mad scientist. And that's the kind of... Um, that's the kind of DP you need. And he's like a dream for any kind of director. Um, he's also like 20, 25 years older oh, than me. Wow. Which was, which was so important, which was so great for our relationship. Like What, just the wisdom? Yeah, well, just he brought something. He was just so different than me, but yet so similar. So like when we were interviewing uh, cinematographers, it came down to two. It was Adam had this really great... Uh, female cinematographer and she was fantastic and she came into the interview and she really understood the script and the emotion and and she almost had me bawling my eyes out and uh, i wanted to hire her and then when i met adam um we didn't really quite connect and we were talking different languages and hmm. he was very technical and at first he, he came across as being really technical and very specific and if if he were a high school class, he'd be math and science, and I'd be like English and social studies with lunch <laughs> thrown in, right? Um, so it didn't feel like we were talking the same language, so I was going to hire uh, the other cinematographer, and then I thought, do you know what? I don't need another me, because mm. um, she felt very much like me. like right. uh, and, and I was, uh, again, to, use, to bring up Star Trek, I, I felt like uh, Captain Kirk doesn't need another Captain Kirk. He needs a Spock. And uh, Adam definitely filled that role of being the Spock, like being the, the technical uh, wizard. And, you know, we had so many things that were going to be very complicated with the shoot of Brotherhood, you know, shooting on a real lake uh, with miners and chasing weather. And so much of Brotherhood is about the light and getting the light right. Also, there was stuff in a tank with green screen involved, like a lot of technical uh, work. So the fact that Adam uh, was and is such a pro and kind of like from like an old Hollywood kind of world, even though he's mostly worked in Canada, like he's actually in Video Village smoking a stogie. And I'm going, <laughs> right? Like he's, you know, or like, you know, we had a scene that we shot like when a thunderstorm was, like a real thunderstorm was coming to a close and, and the gaffers were like, oh, you know, union rules, you know, we can't go up on a ladder and, you know, for like at least 45 minutes until the last thunder strike. And Adam was just like, what day? Like, I was like, when I was shooting that movie for George Romero, I was on a roof and it was raining. And but that's the kind of guy I needed. Right. And then later I found out or not later, but during the process of shooting Brotherhood, it's just like, man, this guy is like a, a Renaissance poet. Uh, this guy's like a Restoration Era poet as well, you know, so he really understood um, what I wanted to achieve. So I think that the reason why the film looks so good and so sumptuous, and, and we were really much, we were going for not a Hollywood look, but an old Hollywood look. We were going for that classic, like my favorite filmmaker is David Lean, right? So like say like like a, a mini Lawrence of Arabia kind of mini epic sort of feel. Mm -hmm. um, 
so yeah so just you know having adam as my lieutenant i think was 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 the reason why the film looks the way it looks awesome so that's a little bit about the who and why and i really appreciate you giving the love to the people that helped you and i'll give you more opportunity to do that i'm sure there's many more people you want to thank but tell us a little bit about this the script the plot and and why you were attracted to the story in the first place. So Brotherhood is based on a true story about a 1926 tragedy that happened on Balsam Lake in the Kawarthas. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a, the Brotherhood of St. Andrew Leadership Group, which is an Anglican group, which is at, of St. James uh, Cathedral in Toronto. Uh, they were they went to Balsam Lake for a two-week holiday, like two weeks of, you know, watercraft and sitting around a campfire archery lessons paddling lessons and on the second night there they set off across the lake uh in a 30-foot indian war canoe uh which is a very tippy canoe it was not a great idea to set out with so many boys and so late um and they were broadsided by a wave like a, a summer squall kicked up and now that i've been to the real balsam lake i can uh, attest to you that these storms do come from nowhere and sometimes they last like five minutes. It's extraordinary. Um, the boys went tumbling into the wash and, uh, the movie brotherhood is, is about their quest to stay alive. It's a, it's a survival story about them trying to grip and hold on to the canoe for dear life. Um, and it's a transformative story. It's about boys becoming men within the course of one evening and there's a ticking time clock. It's, who's going to survive until, you know, morning. I mean, that's what happens in the film. And and when I discovered the true story, when I was doing my research, it was like, okay, well, this is what happens. A, B, C, D, E, F. But uh, as a screenwriter, it's my job to f- figure out what the movie is about. So, you know, the movie isn't just about this accident. It's like one of the, the bigger themes here. So mm-hmm. for me, it was very uh, exciting to get my hands into the guts and figure out, what was the theme and, and and for me it's a story about boys becoming men and the whole male condition mm-hmm. um but also a lot of that is really informed by the decade before 1926 uh which is which was totally uh which was totally about the great war um these the camp leaders were uh, veterans of the great war and these boys were you know the generation that grew up fatherless um maybe even the first generation like in that we're aware of like in in like fairly modern times um you know boys who were left uh fatherless by this seminal conflict um or um you know their dads did come home from the war but when they came home they were the shell of the men that they once were Mm -hmm. Um, so i think any story that's about fatherless boys or or boys who are rudderless or apathetic or alone who are coming together um, I think that speaks to an audience today. So that was very exciting for me. It certainly does. And it, it, I, you don't have to agree with me, but I really feel like masculinity is under attack right now for a number of different reasons from a, do- a number of different fronts. And there's so much sim- symbolism in this film, which I appreciated. A lot of times that stuff will skate over me. I'll just be appreciating the film. But those boys laying on that overturned canoe, uh, you know, I, I don't feel like we have a, uh, an initiation of boys to make them men these no, days. No. And, no, you know, you, we used to have when we came from tribes in the Amazon and there's still tribes in the Amazon that practice this, this ceremonial. They almost take the 10 or 11 year old boy off the mother's tit, for lack of a better. Like they're still breastfeeding mm-hmm. at, way late into life. And they're taken in this dramatic dance. The elders come across the bridge from the island and they grab this this boy and he's screaming, mommy, mommy, mommy. And the mother plays into this and then they they abscond with him across the bridge to the island where he's kept for a year. And he's the boy is killed figuratively, for lack of a better term. And he comes back a man. Now, you know, I'm 51 years old, never married, no kids. I kind of I kind of I can get with that. Because, you know, you have different you know, when your son is born or when you're married or well, you know, there's all these different phases of your life where you're the boys kind of chipped away and chipped away and chipped away. And so some, some of us never get that chipping. And it was 
man, it was really cool. While wow, the acting is just out of this world, you know, and that's another thing I expect is, well, it's a Canadian movie. I expect someone to suck really bad in this it's movie. Not like some kind of wooden <laughs> Canadian yeah. acting. Yeah. And and just watching them, you know, whether they were at the camp or on the on the back of this overturned canoe. I just felt like, wow, this is really symbolism that represents the the killing of the boy and the making of a man. Yeah, and we don't have we don't have ritual anymore. We don't have initiation. Um, you know, when I was growing up, uh, my my parents put me in Boy Scouts. I was a beaver, and then I became a cub, and then I became a scout. I didn't love scouting. But I liked it a lot, you know, like mm -hmm. I had friends there. Um, I, I didn't love it so much because I didn't really like the camping aspect, but I'm glad that I did it. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in a Catholic family, we were in catechism, which is like Sunday school, but on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Uh, my brother and I were in Squires um, in the Knights of Columbus. Uh, we were always busy with swimming and different activities. I was in a sporty kid and I hated sports, but thankfully my family let me do things that weren't team sports like judo or, or swimming or something I could handle. Um, the, I think the problem today is, and, and you know, also this is something that Robert, the camp leader felt. That what a great character he was. What a great character. Wow. He was perfect. Yeah. Well, he, he was a veteran of the, of the First World War, and, you know, a, a similar, the concern that we have about the state of boyhood right now, that happened then in the 1920s. It's kind of like why the, like why the Boy Scouts were formed. Like, it was, you know, Lord Baden-Powell, I think, in 1912. It was the beginning of the modern Olympics uh, in the early 1910s. Mm -hmm. People were concerned about the state of boyhood. They were concerned that they were spending too much time sitting in front of the radio, you know, we could say internet now, you know, they were worshiping movies that were about gangsters in the 1920s. We could say that now. Um, so uh, that's why Robert took those boys on that camp, on that lake, to kind of push them out. He believed that, you know, boys needed time, like, you know, rubbing elbows with one another. He wanted to see grass-stained sleeves. Um, we, we need that now. Like, you know, uh, and some of the books that I used in my research for Brotherhood was was Iron John, which is um, a book that came out in the 70s, and I think it was re-released in the 90s, which is the story of boyhood and manhood through myth, which is, you know, akin to, you know, what you said about your story about the Amazonians, um, you know, uh, boys going through rites of passage um, and how important that was, or boys being mentored, you know, tribal chieftains, knights and squires. Robert Butcher believed in the power of knights and squires as well. Elders. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's funny that because like when you look at like, say, video games, I feel kind of um, I feel kind of mixed feelings about it because should boys spend all their time on the Xbox? No, they shouldn't. But then there's also like people who believe philosophically, even scientifically, that boys are attracted to video games because they feel a sense of accomplishment from getting to level to level to level and that boys brains um which are just, which we have to admit are just different than girls. No, 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 no. They're, we're all the same, dude. We're all the same. Our sexual differences are nil. They're none. You can't say that here because YouTube will shut me down, dude. You can't have outrageous takes oh, like that. Okay. <laughs> Fine. We're all we're all the same. <clears throat> we're all one big gelatinous <laughs> that came out of the primordial ooze, and we're all the same. I don't know, like that. No, the processing of the male brain, though. Make your point. Sorry to interrupt. I won't do that no, again. No, that's okay. Uh, well, I mean, there's been, you know, plenty of studies that suggest that there's actually value in boys being going to a boys' school and being in an all, all boy environment. Um, boys and girls learn differently. It's not that one is better than the other. Um, boys are more action oriented and um, also are more rambunctious. Um, and more rough and tumble and uh boys these days get punished for that which i find to be kind of frightening well um, yeah it, the idea is sit still and be good like the girls in your class and everything's good but if you're ahd or you're hyperactive or you can't sit yeah. still or you didn't burn off your est your estrogen your testosterone in the playground 
and you come and you bring it back into the classroom, you're going to end up with the strap in the principal's office. Well, there was a story just even recently in the States about this kid getting expelled or suspended because he was going around the classroom going pew, 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 pew right? And to him, I'm guessing that was like a Star Wars moment. Yeah. And mm -hmm. to the parents, it was, you know, this kid is the next Columbine killer. He's a, it's a microaggression. <laughs> well, I, it, but, it, but that's very concerning to me because... Mm -hmm. um, and I also, I, I think it's concerning to women. I think it's concerning to mothers. I think, uh, I think, I think I have friends who are mothers to boys and they're like, I think that they wonder like, how do we raise boys today? Because you want the manly middle ground. You want that, you know, that, that sweet spot of like, a, like a, of a, you want a gentleman. Right. You don't want the toxic masculinity. You don't want the, you know, the Donald Trump, but also like, why are we stripping away the qualities that are inherent to boys and trying to make them into something that they're not? It's funny. My, my uh, brother's grandparents in law, they went to church last Christmas and they came home with a flyer from the priest. And I think that the priest had been receiving a lot of complaints about kids um, being naughty during mass. And all it said on the flyer was, God put the wiggle in little kids. And I was just like, wow, you know, like, that's amazing. Like, when we talk about hyperactive kids, especially, like, you know, boys, um, it's like, God put the wiggle in little kids, you know? Like, it's just like, they're not formed yet. No. And, no. and I think that young boys and guys, I think they need to go down to the riverbank to forge for frogs i think they need to build a tree for it i think like for me i i don't want to force i don't want to say boys have to pay, play team sports because i hated team sports um but i loved being outdoors and and for me I, I mean i used to walk around like cup camp where we'd go on hikes and i'd go like this and i'd film it in my brain i i didn't know that it was supposed to be this <laughs> but i'd film it like this and yeah I would pretend I was on the forest moon of Endor or, you know, like when I was on Cub Camp. So, you know, um, also, I mean, and it's not just boys, it's girls as well. We need to get back outdoors. And one of the other books that I read when I was researching Brotherhood was by Dr. Richard Lube, which is called Last Child in the Woods. And it's about nature deficit uh, syndrome, which is a real thing. Really? Yeah. Nature, like we like nature is curative. Like no, we need, yeah. the human being needs to spend time outdoors and um, you know, this culture that we live in now and, and both my brother and my sister-in-law are high school teachers and they tell me about it all the time. Like, do you remember, I mean, I'm a bit younger than you, but it was like, be home by the time the street lamps were on. Mm -hmm. Now it's just like, be home. Where are you texting, texting? It's just like, we're creating a generation and it's probably my generation or our generation, like the gen actors, we're creating a generation of like babies softies yep and and bringing it back to brotherhood um i think that's what robert butcher was concerned about with you know his brood now the difference between robert and the other camp counselor uh named arthur who's played by brendan fletcher is that they they come at educating young boys from different angles sure whereas robert he actually says in the movie risk builds character and arthur says challenge builds character Right. Um, you know, and, and in many ways, Robert is wrong. Like he's the architect of this disaster. He was well intentioned. Um, but uh, there's, you know, what is acceptable risk? Mm. It's like the story of, um, you know, when we were shooting, I, there was that drowning in Algonquin Park. That kid drowned um, and it, it was it, it was determined that he couldn't swim. And the teacher was found culpable for that. Uh, again, my brother and sister-in-law being teachers when they heard this they were horrified because what teacher what educator once would actually put their child like put one of their students in harm's way it's like it's the parents who caused that like the the, the parents sh like the kitchen got have gone to camp mm, you know? and yeah. even like when we were doing brotherhood like we had cast and we found out that one of the kids didn't know how to swim and he uh and he had lied in his audition about wow. um, being, being able to swim, <laughs> and we let we let him go because you can't you no, can't mess sure. around with that, right? Yeah, you, know, you cut him loose. You mean you didn't put him in the film? Yeah, 
we had to kind of lose. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. It's a devastating phone call for me, but it's like you can't swim, and we're shooting the movie this quickly and in such a short amount of time. Like, I needed, when I was casting Brotherhood, like I said to the casting director, I was like, I need, like, hockey players. Like, I need, like, guys who are, and they kind of all were, although I don't know if they were hockey players or not, but, like, you need, like, good Canadian kids who can, who like the outdoors, who, you know, cause in the movie, you see them, they're doing backflips, they're swimming, they're, you know, they're flying around, they're doing a human pyramid, like, uh, like, I kind of, like, needed athletes for this movie, which is, again, so funny, because I'm so not an athlete myself, but... <laughs> Now, just uh, going back to the kid that lied to get into, you know, get into the movie, man, that for me, it's instantly the impact of integrity is instantly there for me. You know, you've got responsibility, like in the real world, you're shooting a film <laughs> and you you find out that somebody's lied on their resume to get a job. And this is not something you want to lie about. This is life and death. You're doing a movie about life and death, but it just it just seems surreal to me and kind of ironic that here you are shooting a movie about the the you know kids drowning, and there's an actor that's lying about the fact that he can't that he can swim, and I just like immediately drawn to the the irony of yeah. the impact of the lack of integrity could cost you your life. Well. I- so okay i don't know if he actually lied like this is what happened we were paddling we had a paddling practice for the war canoe it was the first time we were getting the actors together uh and we were at uh, ash bridges bay in toronto and it's a balmy beach club and we we had hired like a really good war canoe coach and right when the guys were about to get on the war canoe one of the kids mothers went up to one of the actors the older actors who plays a camp counselor and mm-hmm. said oh do you mind keeping an eye on my son he can't swim and the actor came to me and said oh i already feel like a camp counselor because one of the moms came up to me and said blah 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 and i said what <laughs> And the actor, the older actor, felt so badly for letting the cat out of the bag. But I was just like, thank you for telling me. And so I discussed it with the casting director. And the casting director was like, we need to let him go. And so like, when I talked to the young guy, I was like, I'm so sorry, but your mom kind of talked you out of a job. And that kind of maybe happens a bit with stage moms. Like, they're kind of like a, their own unique animal. But um, like, I'll tell you this. Like, if anyone gets injured on a film set, it's the first, like the first AD, the first assistant director, will never work again. Wow. Like that's just the way it is. And and people who don't really quite understand the film industry kind of think that the director is, you know, the almighty. The director, we're really not the almighty. The the producer is the almighty. The you know the you know they sign the checks. On the set, the management of the set is the first AD. He wow. runs the set. Okay. I say action and cut, and you know sometimes <laughs> he says action and cut. Um, but if the if someone gets injured on a film set, the first AD just won't work again. Wow. Um, so and and you know even like uh, our star Brendan Fletcher, he came on quite late. Like he was cast like a week before we started shooting. But uh, if you do, do a little bit of research. Um, he was injured on the on the set of a TV uh, of of a TV show like on a major network, um, and it really affected him. Like he had a gun, he had a fake gun go off, and the um, the blank hit him in the neck, um, and he had to have an emergency. Is it tracheotomy? Oh, wow. It happened Jeez. in Sudbury, um, and I like Brandon Fletcher is like the most fearless, probably the most talented actor I know, and I saw how that affected him. I saw how how that took someone who is who took a lot of who was very courageous. I could see how that affected him emotionally, and it was a a big moment in his life. And it was just a moment of him, like his character had to commit suicide or pretend to commit suicide. Um, so our first AD was, you know, obviously very cognizant about keeping the set as safe as possible because you're dealing with minors and you're dealing with a real lake, and then you're dealing with a water tank. It is like things can go wrong mm-hmm. now how many i'm so i got so many questions for you richard bell is my guest he's the writer and director of brotherhood movie if you're googling it put 2019 in front of it so you get the right movie because there is another movie named with the same name i guess how, like <laughs> okay. 
how many of these conversations were legit and historical and how many survivors are there still around that you were able to hang with and get the stories from like how much of this is fiction versus you know hollywood storytelling versus actual you know this is what happened this is what he said to me before he did such and such wow it's well it's really interesting because there's um there's a point as guys as the writer and the director there's a point where i stopped being the writer i stopped being the screenwriter and right. i had to move on to my new job which is being the director uh so when i felt like the script was done or i felt like it was cooked I moved on to looking at it from a director's point of view. I, I'm saying that because when I went back and I looked at some of the historical documents and newspaper articles from the past, the scanned microfiche, I was actually quite surprised by how closely I followed the actual story oh, of good. that night. Wow. Um, so yes, I did use my imagination to fill in a lot of the blanks, but there are some lines in there that are direct quotes from the newspapers at the time oh. uh, and there's things that are true like you know uh oliver mardell played by evan marsh he did work at the wrigley chewing gum co uh company mm -hmm. um you know one of the guys like maybe it wasn't leonard but maybe it was another character his father drowned mm -hmm. um there's a lot of details in there that are are true like the story about the watch the wristwatch stopping when the accident happened when the boy fell in the lake there's so much stuff that's true. There's a few things that I had to move around, mm -hmm. and I also had to create some composite. Uh, com uh, I had to condense some characters because um, in real life there's eleven boys who went out, okay. uh, and in the movie it's uh, or who died, and then in the movie it's eight. Um, because it was for me, How it was more important that you be able to follow the individual streams of the characters, uh, like the character arcs. Than to be historically accurate like mm -hmm. with 11 people you would not be able to track um the characters so there's 11 in total so there's 11 in total who died and okay. four who lived in the movie oh, there's so there's eight. there's 15 of them in that canoe in real, in real life, life yeah. okay and in your story there was 10 there was a uh, there was eight, there was yeah there something you. like that i don't know I told you I'm not math and science. <laughs> That's Adam Suica. <laughs> so, uh, so I will assume there's no survivors then. There's no one left alive to tell the story. Well, I, I, I can't say that I did an exhaustive search okay. to find out who was still alive. Uh, even though I do, uh, you know, I admitted earlier to being a treasure hunter. For me, it was less. Uh, for me, the whole story took place in this three days. Mm -hmm. um, and the future, like what happened afterwards, wasn't as interesting to me, nor did I think it informed the movie in any meaningful way. So, uh, like the first draft of the movie took place, um, like at, in the Lindsay Town Hall, and it was about the Inquisition into the accident, and we went back in time and ping pong that way. But that just felt like a television movie. So I threw out the inquest completely because it was like, it just felt too academic and, mm -hmm. and boring. Um, for me, it was way more important to look not to the future as to what happened to these characters or to their descendants. It was all my time was spent in the past. And for me, that meant going to the 1910s and looking at the culture there and also investigating and throwing myself into the world of um, uh, the First World War. Mm. Uh, tell me about going back to Balsam Lake for the premiere. That uh, I, I saw a little bit about it on online i'm not sure where exactly but uh i was just like oh I, you know kind of i'm like hey i'm gonna interview this guy today and i'm like reading the, the synopsis and, and blah 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 and then i read that and he's like really dude that's so cool he says i know balsam lake i've been there i'm like me too <laughs> yeah well the uh i have to admit that was something that was always in our marketing plan which was to do a screening at balsam lake um in the real community where the accident happened I didn't know that it was going to be the first screening. Like, I didn't know it was going to be the debut oh. screening. Okay. Um, so there was obviously a lot of poetry and beauty, you know, associated with that. Mm -hmm. um, I could not have done it if it weren't for a fellow who lived on the lake. His name is Doug Patterson. Uh, he's a banker. He works in Toronto, but he, he, you know, like everybody in Ontario, they're, you know, they're very passionate about cottage culture, and he, he has a a cottage on Balsam Lake that's been in his family, I think, since the 18th century, late 18th century. Um, and it was interesting because he contacted me just through Facebook and he said, you know, I, I was always fascinated about the story 
the true story about the Brotherhood of St. Andrew, and I used to go to church, and there was a plaque hung up that had all the boys' names um, who drowned. And uh, when I did my research trip out to Balsam Lake in 2011, I, I, I found the minister who you know took care of that church, and it's just this tiny church uh, called St. Thomas uh, in Kirkfield, and I saw that same plaque. So it was interesting to talk to Doug because he was like, yeah, I was 10 years old and I used to look at that plaque and I wouldn't even pay attention to what the priest was saying. I was just wondering what happened that night to those boys. So he was the one who organized the Balsam Lake and Kirkfield hometown screenings. And he did that in tandem with um, the curator of the uh, Kirkfield Museum. So, I mean, it takes a village to make a movie. It takes a village to put on any kind of premiere, right? So I was in Vancouver and I was talking to Doug and the Kirkfield people, and they put together, like, you know, kind of like a world-class event, um, you know, and they were very open to my ideas, and they had a lot of great ideas themselves, and and they, um, Doug put his put his money where his mouth was, which was, which was like, he was like, I want the actors here, so he paid for Brendan Fair to come up from New Mexico, he paid for Brendan Fletcher to come from Vancouver, me to come from Vancouver, um, and he uh, he hosted us and put us up in his cottage and, and you know like it, it was it was great because the actors loved it they felt like they felt like you know the stars that they are you know like they deserved that and wow. we went out on the lake and we approximated the spot where the boys drowned the minister who I you know was in Congress with in 2011. Uh, she came, we did a dedication to the boys, uh, the actors threw uh, flowers into the lake, um, you know, for their character, like, for, you know, for the character they played. It was incredibly moving. Um, the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario came, uh, Elizabeth Dowswell, and some of the crew came. Um, we had a dinner at the Kirkfield, uh, the Lions Club, and it kind of, it was funny because I was sitting next to Brendan Fair and and Brendan Fair has been in the industry like, you know, forever. And he was like, you know, a bad boy, kind of like matinee idol in the late nineties, early two thousands when he was on the television show Roswell. And, you know, he's kind of seen it all. And, and he was sitting next to me at the dinner and it was, uh, you know, I'm sitting next to the Lieutenant governor of Ontario. And he was like, wow, there's something really yesteryear about this experience. He's like, when was the last time that a community gathered, for dinner and a movie, you know, and, 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 um, you know, the priest, uh, she said, you know, grace and we bowed our heads in grace. And it, it reminded me of when I was actually in Cubs and we had had, we'd have something called the father son banquet, mm. which now you could never do because that would be so politically incorrect. <laughs> right. But like, you know, the fathers and the sons sat down and we broke bread and there was this real feeling of, you know, community and you're breaking bread and, and everybody was so excited. Um, and the actors were kind of bouncing off the walls and were posing for pictures. And then when dinner was finished, um, you know, and it's like, and, and all the people in, in the kitchen are like, you know, like, like the old ladies who, you know, who you would see like in the kitchen and this one lady's telling me off for like not eating my dinner fast enough. And <laughs> are you done with that, hon? You know, and there's just something really special and authentic about that. Wow. Then we went across the street, we went to the museum, and we put on the film. And, you know, they had blacked out the windows because it's an old Presbyterian church. And they had decorated it. They had put tents underneath the movie screen and put up paddles. And there was a real feeling of hometown pride. And it was a very interesting moment for me because I think every filmmaker sort of wants to have their premiere at TIFF, right? But it's just kind of like, well... Do you have your premiere at TIFF and are you like one of many films and then kind of nothing happens? Like maybe you go to a, you know, a party afterwards and you eat spinach dip out of a carved bread bowl and you chat and say, wow, we had a movie at TIFF. Or do you have your premiere like where the actual true story of your movie happened? And connect with, with the community. Kind of, with that kind of sparkle in the air, that kind of you know, like a little bit of pomp and pageantry because the lieutenant governor was there, but also that kind of enthusiasm and magic. And and that happened again also because the lieutenant governor really loved the movie and she wanted to do a screening uh, at Queen's Park uh, for Remembrance Day. So we just did, I just got back from Toronto because of that. So that was on oh. November 7th. 
Yeah, so because of the backstory of the First mm -hmm. World War, because of right. the Great War, she was like, I want to do a screening for active military and for veterans. Wow. So we had like active Canadian forces personnel there. There was a veteran there who had like, a friend of mine was there, he's a veteran of Afghanistan, and he said, I have never seen a, um, is it a, a which, what is the highest medal, the Medal of Valor or it, it was like it was like the most prestigious medal that a veteran could have, and he said, "I have never seen that medal on a living person before." And it was this old timer, and he was just like, "Yes, I, he had stormed, you know, the beaches of Normandy," and he's like, "What's this movie all about, young man?" And I told him, oh. and I, "If I hear any snoring, I know it's you." And he's like, "I won't fall asleep. Don't you worry." You know, and, and what a pleasure to like have a screening again. It was just so different. Like it wasn't a film festival. It wasn't like a an industry event. But here we are in the Lieutenant Governor's suite at Queens Park. You know, four days before Remembrance Day, the cast is there, the crew is there, the veterans are there, and uh, we watched the movie. And mm -hmm. and so I feel very. I mean, yes. I've orchestrated these things, and I'm not saying that these just happened by accident or fell in my lap, and definitely they took a lot of work. I don't like being called lucky because I have to I have to do so much work to get these things, but I definitely feel very blessed. And like things like having a screening you know, in Kirkfield on Balsam Lake or in Queens Park, th that, those things are pure magic to me. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, any revelations, impacts, uh, like... Uh, yeah, obviously outside of you know the impressiveness of a unexpected actor or something like that but the concept of the film and and over the period of shooting was there anything that really impacted you you know seriously and and deeply moved you during you know something you got that you didn't expect to get out of the making of this movie flat-footed look at that wow well no because i'd have to say no because the movie took so long to make. I had worked on it for about nine years. And wow, really? so there was no kind of real surprises when the movie actually started taking off because I was so well prepared and everything. It's kind of like thinking about a symphony almost all your life and then just getting up there and conducting that symphony. Hmm. It's like, well, what are the surprises? It's like, well, no, it, there really aren't any surprises because this is actually I can tell you what my surprise is. My surprise is I didn't expect the movie to turn out exactly the way I wanted it to, like it did. And it did. Yeah. That's wow. the thing that surprised me the most. So and but it also doesn't surprise me in the capacity that I was very well prepared. Mm -hmm. And there was like a lot of drawings that were done and mood boards and color schemes and and um you know the actors were given so much i made them read three books like i made them read last child in the woods right uh, the boy crisis or sorry uh, real boys um and iron john and i don't know if they all read them but like they, they were really put in the world um so the movie the movie very much turned out the way i wanted it um and so there wasn't really any kind of surprises for me the moments of impact or or being moved by something probably came more in the writing process. Like okay. when, you know, I, you know, thinking about the boys and thinking about, you know, their ordeal on the lake, perhaps that, um, or, um, you know, people have asked me, was going to the real balsam lake, you know, like incredibly moving. And, and yes, it was, but I, I would say that I was probably more moved when I went to the cemetery, St. James cemetery, which is off parliament street, which is where they're buried. Uh, and Robert's in the center, and he's flanked by, like, uh, about five or six of the boys. Like, Oliver Mardell is there, Jack Wigington is there. Uh, that would be impactful for me, like, going and chatting with them. And even just because it took so long to make the movie, just me going to Toronto and kind of giving them an update on how the film was going. Um, or maybe going and, and having a chat with them when I had shot the film and before I flew back to Vancouver saying, okay, we did it. I hope you like it. <laughs> and, and seeing that grave, you know, with snow on it or, you know, in the springtime or in the summertime or, you know, dusting the leaves off of it. Maybe that has been the most impactful thing for me. Can you speak to the real life actors and how they related to their roles and how maybe they had any similarities or anything that jumped out? I mean, I can't imagine being with that many young talented actors and not just 
falling in love with them. I mean, this is a real oh, journey, yeah. a storytelling journey, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I love actors to begin with, and I definitely understand actors and I, uh, the actor's language. And, and I, you know, I studied to be an actor. I went to Studio 58 here in Vancouver, so which is like a, a, a conservatory-style theater school. So it's kind of like the West Coast version of uh, the National Theater School in Montreal. So I was very much involved in acting in, in junior high school and high school. And then when I was 19, I went to Studio 58. And then when I graduated at 23 like i was like my graduating class had three people in it because the the it was such a difficult school to get through um so i've always had because i was formerly an actor i've always had an affinity for actors and actors are strange beasts they're very mm. special magical animals that really um they're all like with all these guys i mean there was like what 13 14 guys they were all different they were all completely different people, and they all required something different from me. And it was all about making myself available to these different actors. Um, and I, I'd only worked with one of them before, uh, uh, Brendan Fletcher. He was in my last film called 18. How old and are I these guys? With, pardon me? How old are these guys, roughly in range? So the youngest was 14, okay. and the oldest was about 25. Okay. So um, they all needed something different from me, and they were all... Like my one of my favorite parts of of, cast, of of making the film was casting the movie uh, with my casting director Brian Levy. Like, um, and he's an old theater school grad, so we spoke the same language in the when we were casting. Um, so it was very interesting how like just having all the different guys come in and 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 it's so interesting because no one lacked talent who came in. It was just casting a movie like this. It's just you're you're playing chess or you're putting together a puzzle like. Not only do Jack and Will have to look alike because they're brothers, they you know they have to feed off of each other. You know you can't you know one you, know, you can't have too many guys who look the same. You know I wanted a redhead, I wanted a blonde. Like you know I, I was always moving the pieces around, right? Um, but they were very easy to fall in love with, and they're still easy to love because they bring such a they bring such a magic wherever they go, and especially in Balsam Lake. Like the community just loved them, you know, and and yeah, at Queens Park as well. Like it, it's kind of like the difference between having like canned music play in a room and having a real instrument play in the room. Mm -hmm. Like when these actors are in the room, like <laughs> they're just so lovely. And 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 one of the the things that I remember about like there was this one actor when we were shooting up in Wawa. Um, you know, there's the craft service table and all the food and the donuts and the muffins and the coffee are out. And this actor was, you know, young teenage actor, probably one of the most successful guys and uh, had been on two TV series and had like 155,000 followers on Instagram. And he comes up to me and he's like, uh, yo, Rich, um, is, <laughs> is this up for grabs? And he's talking about the craft service table. And I'm like, yeah, this is all for you guys. He's like, oh, thanks, man. And I was just like, wow like no ego no attitude what a cool guy like like i don't know like good mom good dad what is it like good canadian kid you know there's a saying in hollywood you know if you want to cast the all-american guy you have to get look to canada wow and that's why that's we have cool. like ryan gosling or we have ryan reynolds or you know Corey monteith rest in peace right like it's it's like those good all-american guys are actually good old Canadian boys <laughs> and that's what I had on brotherhood I had good old Canadian boys good Ontario kids who were raised nicely and were just a real pleasure to work with the only problem I had with them the challenge I had with them was that they would just get so rambunctious and I would have to like crack the whip a couple times or say save it for the camera like can you do that when we're rolling <laughs> Awesome, dude! I really appreciate your time, man. And like I said, uh, everyone needs to go see this movie. Where, where, where can we see it, anyways? It... So it premieres on uh, December six, Friday, December six, okay. at uh, Young and Young Dundas. So okay. at the Cineplex there at Young and Dundas. Okay. Um, I believe it's opening a week later in Sudbury, um, but I think that's to be confirmed. We're really hoping that the uh, Toronto screening at Cineplex is the spark that lights the flame and. It goes across the country. 
I mean, definitely for me, I'd love it to open in Vancouver um, because, you know, that's where my family is. That's where my friends are. That's where I am. Um, but uh, Toronto is a great Toronto's a great start. Um, you know, I think it's very fitting that it's opening, obviously, in Toronto because this is a story about a bunch of Toronto boys and, you know, they're buried like two miles away, you know. So I, I think it's very meaningful. And I'm, I'm just happy that it's all actually at a Cineplex as well because it's screened at Cinefest Sudbury in September um, and uh, it was at a Silver City and that mm. is the way to oh, watch yeah. Oh, yeah. any movie but like this movie just seeing it on a five story screen with that Dolby 7.1 surround mm. sound I was it was my first time seeing the movie like that and I was like wow just wow you know mm. so, you Richard Bell is my guest writer and director of Brotherhood wow um, dude I know you're a storyteller and I, I really appreciate the conversation here. Underlying commitment to your, maybe not this movie, but you're probably kind of a traditional lefty, you know, the arts, you know, we, we, I consider myself a lefty too and kind of like an artist, even though I don't play in a band, I'm not an actor. This, there's still some artistry to being a host of, of a show. Yeah. So your underlying commitment for your approach to movies, what would you say that is? Well, I mean, I've only made two movie, two feature films, and one, the kind of like short feature. Um, what is my commitment to movie making? Well, your underlying commitment, like I, I don't know, I would imagine that someone like you is like, oh, I'm going to touch, move, and inspire with this story. I'm going to, you know, move people to a positive action. Or I know that's all kind of hokey pokey, but uh, it's yeah, a bit I just kumbaya. yeah, yeah, a little bit of dog a tree, uh, but. <laughs> Yeah, I just wonder if you have an underlying commitment that kind of runs through your life and then comes over to your storytelling and your movie making of, you know, I want, I want, I want to change the world. I want. Uh, I don't know if it's that. Like, okay. I, like I don't know if I chose movie making or if it chose me. Like, when I was a kid, I was always making films, uh, little videos, you know, with a cat, like in the '80s, with camcorders, and hmm. I, I think I made my first movie when I was. 13 um so it's something i maybe it, it shows me it's it, mm. like what i'm doing now is really just the 2019 version of what i was doing in 1986 um you know with probably hopefully a more sophisticated talent and 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 better technology and a bigger budget uh i, I don't know if i i think it kind of i think this career chose me i, I definitely didn't come up with any kind of plan b which i i really should have done and I, i'm sure that would have made that would that would have made my mother very happy i i i feel like i'm in this industry to stay and succeed and i i, I definitely haven't i don't think i've done it the correct way i i didn't go to film school and i keep getting kind of like um corrected and scolded for the way that i do things in filmmaking. That being said, I wouldn't have Brotherhood and I wouldn't have done 18, um, you know, 10 years ago if, if I did it the right way um, mm -hmm. or if I did it the uh, another person's way. I didn't go to, like I said, I didn't go to film school. Uh, I, 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 I want to tell stories. I, I'm very, very passionate about authenticity. Mm -hmm. I, I have no tolerance for things that are inauthentic. Um, or fake or feel forced. Um, I would rather not be involved with something that's inauthentic. I would rather be, I would rather be broke than 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 do something that's inauthentic. I think you, I think you've nailed it. I think that's uh, that you've nailed the answer right there. And it doesn't surprise me because I I feel like that's an underlying commitment in this film is that the authenticity and 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 a word that's very important to me with integrity. You know honor your word do what you say you're going to do there's more to that all to to being a man and the man that is a great answer to something that i felt all the way through this film so well i'm proud okay. of you brother i'm really proud of you and i think you got a winner here i'm a little biased because you know i knew i was doing the interview when i was watching it so but it dude if it sucked 
I, w I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Yeah, I seriously, <laughs> I would not. Uh, I th and I didn't. I don't know you. I didn't know. Authenticity. Yeah, yeah. I would. I didn't know that you were. You know, uh, a, a personable guy like this. I trust in Ingrid to hook me up with uh, decent people, so I appreciate that. But uh, yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all because, man, there was, oh man, there was a lot of wows in this movie for me. And you know, you know what I normally do when I watch a movie? Pause, rewind, pause, rewind. What did he say? What? Oh, let's turn the captions on. Pause, rewind, dude. Oh, yeah. And I don't want to spoil it for everyone, but I kind of watched it on my phone i know you don't want to hear that but i didn't stop it once richard i did not stop <laughs> it <laughs> once uh, i mean i stopped i watched the first half and then i went back and then i watched the the last two thirds and and dude uh like i said i'm really proud of you and i i hope it that this is the gift that uh that uh, you've earned i don't think anyone deserves anything i think you've earned a, a spot with a decent credit here and uh hey you, you uh I had some trouble getting to sleep last night, and I had an appointment I had to get up to to take my father to to the hospital first thing this morning, and my mind would not shut up. It was, uh, but you know what? I that's what a good movie does to you. It keeps you up, whether you're disturbed or just thinking or what have you. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, telling a stranger I love him and I'm proud of him is kind of weird, but <laughs> I do. <laughs> so. That's happened to me on the internet. <laughs> Well, thank you. I mean, I, the cynicism is easy these days. You got that and right. There's it, apathy is easy these days, and and it's it's too easy. Cynicism is so easy. So it's nice to it's nice to be it's nice to collaborate with people uh, and work with people, whether it be my actors or my crew or Adam, as I mentioned. Uh, Ingrid, like it's just nice to, to meet people who y you feel like what you see, like like what you see is what you get, and you're engaging people from, you know, a really uh, authentic place. And, and an example from for that for me is after the Balsam Lake premiere, um, after spending a weekend with people who were so not cynical and so excited and so happy to be there and so authentic. I kind of went to a dinner party uh, on the way back to Toronto and I was just with regular people again and I couldn't take it. <laughs> I had to say, it was kind of like everyone's masks were. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. like, I couldn't take it. I was like, what, what, what is everyone talking about? And none of this feels real. Like it, it was, I had to go, Oh, please excuse me. I have some emails that I have to attend to cause I just couldn't take it anymore. So, mm. It's nice to have one-on-ones and, 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 and be with people who, you know, have that sparkle um, because that's intangible. Like, it's just – and you can't teach it. Mm -hmm. You can't teach it. All you can do is hopefully have a life where you have mentors and coaches and teachers, like people like a Robert Butcher or an Arthur Landon, who just chip, chip that away and, you know, like – and hold you to account and hold you to a higher standard. Um, I don't know, filmmaking, I think, is... Filmmaking is a contact sport, mm. and it's it's not pretty, and it's... it's There's more reasons to not do it than to do it, to be honest with you. It, it's it's not easy. Um, but it's 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 a real baptism under fire, and I, I, I wouldn't change... I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't change any part of my journey. Awesome. Anybody else you want to acknowledge for helping you get here, obviously, outside of the actors and whatnot that helped this come to life? There's just way too many. Okay. Like, from, from, like, there's just way too many from the funders, financiers, producers, you know, people who move mountains. For me, the people who are really special to me are, um, as I mentioned, Adam Suica, my cinematographer, uh, my first AD, Paco Bermudez, uh, being an assistant director on this movie was no easy task. It was really like, you know, wrangling cats. Um, and uh, and then just the people I went on the journey with when production ended. Um, it's kind of like you, as a director, you have a series of relationships, like mm -hmm. boyfriends or girlfriends after. So Adam was like my first mm -hmm. as my cinematographer. And then it was uh, Sarah Petty, my editor. And, you know, when you say, oh, I watched the movie in one sitting and I wasn't bored, it's like that's a testament to her because, you know, she's given a rock 
and she has to find the diamond within, right? And, and we do that together. Uh, but to tell a simple story that has a great clip is really hard to do. So uh, Sarah is, was just like an excellent collaborator for that. And the thing that was really interesting with, with, for work, uh, working with Sarah was she historically has done a lot of reality television, editing that. And that just makes for a great editor because, you know, you're given uh, – when you do reality or lifestyle television – you're given hours and hours and hours of footage and you have to find the story and distill the story and, and tell it in an articulate and meaningful way. So that makes her a great editor. Mm -hmm. And then like the next kind of like boyfriend, girlfriend I had, I'd say would have been uh, my sound mixer, Brett Killerin. Uh, we spent so much time together uh, getting the sound right. Um, Bill Rousen, my composer, we worked here in Vancouver. Yeah, he was the assistant to Bram Tovey at the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. So he was like the next relationship I had where we were working together very intimately on the score and getting the, the tapestry of the, of the music right. Um, so it's, you know, well, yeah, like it, it's so funny to me about like the whole kind of push to have female directors because uh, – I really feel who's like, making that push <laughs> well, because I feel like people are focusing on the wrong thing. Like movie making is a collaborative sport. It is a contact sport, but it's a collaborative process. And it's just like, I think people are giving way too much power to who the director is and what sex the director should be and what, you know, anatomy they have. Um, because it's like, it's, the producer is way more important than the director. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, our producer was female and she's a woman of color and she's a force of nature and she raised the financing to make this movie. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, like, it, it, it's like, it's like, you know, our editor was female. It's just kind of like, it's, it's the movie is the director. Sure. But it's the producer, it's the editor, it's the cinematographer. It's, it's, it's kind of like looking at a buffet of food and focusing on that should be that when it's just like, no, it's a whole thing, you know, and, and, and movie making is the whole dynamic. Um, I don't think it matters what, like movies don't have a sex. Movies are gender neutral. Why, if anything, movies are female because they're a she, they're like a ship. They're like a, they're mm. like a great, beautiful, majestic thing. And um, I just don't, I don't get the gender politics of, of, of filmmaking because it involves uh, both sexes and it involves every identity to get to tell a great story. I would uh, concur that movies are female only because the making of them has got to be pure chaos. And we all know that chaos is feminine and order, well, order is male. It's the act of creation, right? It's, yeah, it's yeah. the act of creation. You're quite literally birthing, uh, not literally, but you're you're birthing something, mm -hmm. and you know there's that gestation period, like where like for me it was like you know seven years, you know, and and it's the act of creation, and you know women create. This is probably a bit too deep, but God is probably female just for that reason. <laughs> Richard Bell is my guest. The movie is Brotherhood. Man, you look like a very proud father. You look like you got a glow going on there. Uh, I really appreciate the time, Richard. Uh, thank you very oh, much. Really just good lighting. Hey, Richard, uh, for the next movie, I've got an IMDb page. Uh, go check me out. I was uh, walk on and a buddy's okay. film called me and said, hey, you want to fire Erica in the movie tonight? I'm like, dude, seriously? And uh, yeah, my Wait, my you were it being Erica. No, no, I was <laughs> I fired um, Alex the uh, female lead in the movie Fight, which is uh, about a, bear, uh, a single mom that enters the underground bare knuckle boxing world. And I think you'd like it if you check it out. Uh, Lupish, Lupish is the uh, director and screenwriter. Uh, Erica Sherwood is the main lead in it. And uh, all- Are you in Ottawa? No, I'm in St. Catharines, Niagara. Just down oh, okay. gotcha, the, gotcha. just across the street from, uh, across the lake from Toronto. So I'm an hour to Toronto, but 10 minutes to Niagara Falls, so uh, right on the border hopefully, of... Hopefully the movie will come to your neck of the woods, because I know that a lot of people have been putting requests into the TIFF film circuit, and I thought for the TIFF film circuit you had to have shown at TIFF, but it's, I, I don't believe that that's true. I believe that it could be any Canadian film. So if, like, you know, theater owners um, and exhibitors request the movie, 
you know, hopefully it'll pick up because like we, we, we showed at a tiny little film festival in Halliburton like a month, a month ago. And it's like, it was so well attended and it, you know, they added a matinee. And I think that brotherhood has legs in uh, smaller towns. Not that Sudbury was a small town by any stretch of the imagination, but Sudbury was like sold out. It over, uh, it spilled into three theaters but I think that a story like Brotherhood and with the history being a history focused movie and such a Canadian kind of picture, I think it would play well in uh, rural towns and, and, and smaller communities. Richard, thank you very much again, man. It was a really cool conversation. If it comes to TIFF, I will come and see it. If, uh, no, it won't come to TIFF. No, we okay. Get it to TIFF. Okay. But uh, if yeah, if you ever come, uh, if you're ever traveling down this way, uh, I'd be glad to uh, pick you up again. And and you know, on your next pro uh, project, uh, keep me in touch. And uh, and and a great amount of thanks to Ingrid as well for hooking this up. So, yeah, Richard, thank you very much, man. I hope to thank talk you. to you soon. This is a really cool conversation. So thanks for your time, brother. Thank you. Take All right. care. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Now, if I can figure out how to turn this thing off, oh, he's already gone. So that was Richard Bell. He is the writer and director of what uh, just an awesome, awesome film called Brotherhood. And it shook me to my core. Uh, watched it last night. And uh, wow, just an unbelievable movie uh, based on a true story. Um, Brotherhood, it premieres in December. So it's not even out yet. Um, so I guess you can't go see it yet, but, uh, anyway, Richard Bell was my guest. The movie is Brotherhood. It's based on a 1926 story of 14 young men, um, go out in uh, a war canoe, for lack of a better term, and, uh, they're out on Balsam Lake. They get flipped and turned, and it's about their struggle to survive, and, um, the becoming of a man basically on the back of a canoe in the middle of a raging lake it uh it was great so anyway i didn't expect that uh sometimes you're um pleasantly surprised by being moved by a conversation that you're not expecting to move you so uh richard bell really appreciate the time um this will this video you fuckers on facebook this video will self-destruct so that you have to go over to YouTube and watch it, all right? Like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, whatever. Peace out, yo. Uh, I said peace out, yo. Oh, and we're going to say goodbye to these guys over here.